Hey everybody, before we jump right into the action, I just wanted to let you know that these things are streamed on Twitch and if you want to hang out with me while I'm live, you can follow the channel, will be the first link in the description. Okay, opponent opening up with E4. We're gonna be rock solid and we're gonna be going for a Karo Khan, which perhaps could be featured in one of my upcoming chessable courses for black, so... You guys would like to see me doing a chessable course on the Karo Khan for black. So let me know in the comments because I still haven't decided yet. And uh, against the advance, also in the course, but in the series, I'm planning to include this C5 move because it is simply working so well below 2000 rating. It's absolutely insane. This is actually just very strong. Main and only serious move for white is to take, but most of your opponents will either play something like c3 or knight f3 like my opponent does. Knight f3 is not great because we can take and destroy their center. And now we can just develop, hit the pawn. Bishop b5 is what they usually play. But then we can simply unpin, something like bishop to d7. Yeah, see? Now just unpin and usually when they take, I've noticed a lot of people just taking. But you don't want to be taking E with a bishop. That's playable. Even better to take it with a pawn so we can actually get rid of the knight. Then play E6 on the next move because I want to avoid any kind of ideas that he could sack the pawn. We're going to go C5, knight developed via G6, bishop E7, castle. Then bishop will activate this way. Maybe queen B6, maybe can push the pawn. Something like this would be the plan before open up this guy and that's just kind of how the setup would look like are we going to get something like that on the board most likely not but <laughs> bear with me because we're about to see he queen g4 so would get rid of the knight immediately i'll just start knight e7 getting in some development that looks uh, vaguely familiar I see where you're going with that, uh, Mr. Birdfish. Indeed, that is actually a familiar line. <laughs> so Bishop g5. Now, I would like to play queen b6, but an opponent wants to take and then pick up the g7 pawn. So, not super happy about that. Would go long castle, but it's leading to pretty messy position. So I could also do h6 and on bishop takes, take, take back with a queen. A queen looks a little bit awkward, but it's still going to be rerouted and we get a pretty valuable bishop. So I think that's uh, what we do. Either bishop. Yes, the Karo Khan guy is also, it only works against e4. You could also play it against anything else. And that's another idea that I have for a chessable course to just do like c6 d5 against anything and then play it like a london system against any like non e4 opening play it like a london system with reversed colors but if you play c6 d5 against moves that are not e4 that's gonna be most likely named a slav so after 92 as i was saying we can just step back maybe go queen g5 trade queens usually in the karo khan we just love to trade queens and pieces in general because we really like to go into the end games. So that would be doable. It's just that we somehow need to get rid of this threat. So we could also play it with g6 and then bishop g7, that's right. But let's try to get it in the end game. I'm genuinely interested to show you guys how to win this kind of Karo Khan endgame. So it's kind of forced to take, and when they take, Rook is opened up, maybe g4 ideas in case they play the knight. And with the bishop pair and strong pawn center, I mean, this is definitely better for us, a better endgame. So knight f3, as I was saying, this could be annoying now for my opponent. Hitting the knight, then I could also get rid of this knight with c5. Knight has to go there. Could then play c5. Could also go like rook h5, try to hit the pawn now. This just became an idea. 
after G4 got played. And yeah, we'll see. We just we're just basically better because of the bishops and because of the fact that we're controlling all the important central squares. And white is basically having no plan. So knight g5, but that's actually about to get trapped, believe me or not. So bishop here, f4 would be kind of only move. But an easy move, bishop takes rook h5, collecting the pawn. Okay, I've got another idea. Bishop here, f4, but now bishop c5 actually wins. Winning the knight, he will defend, but then we can go f6. And the knight has no squares. He can can't really take us bishop captures. And now this is just lost for my opponent. The knight has absolutely no squares. Those are taken. This is taken. He can try taking and rookie one, but we can simply unpin. So we're just winning a piece. Unfortunately, we don't get to show the squeeze, but this I think uh, also... I hope at least it's quite insightful. Now, this move, because rook e6 allows bishop d4 check, and we collect the rook. And otherwise, if they unpin, we can now just uh, sidestep. Still bishop b6, setting up the trap if he takes. Now, we actually have pretty funny checkmating mod f. Some position if knight moves away. Let's say rook h2 could be mating. Like g3, maybe he just goes h3, and it's just a bit unnecessary. Just gonna keep it simple and go for the trades now. And uh, looking for her to activate the bishop with bishop e4. Could also double up on the h file. Attacking h2. Yeah, I think we can gambit that. Simply focus on activity. If he takes, I want to go g3 and attack h2. So after h3, I can actually take it with the rook because the pawn is pinned. Then play rook h2, double up with mate. They are taking advantage of the pin. Rook to h2, hitting g2, preparing to bring the rook over. Against check, just king g6. And uh, well, f5. Can even take it with a bishop, to be honest. Yeah, that's like only move to avoid the direct mate, but you can simply take. But also go king h6 and rook g2 is huge flat. So let's see. Anything else just loses to rook g2 and rook g8 mate. Or if he moves the rook, rook g8 and idea <coughs> uh, so against this I think this is most precise like if I take with a bishop maybe rook f3 just king here preparing rook g2 Maybe rook f4 is still like a move, but uh, I have in mind to play rook g2, king f1, and perhaps rook f2, just trade rooks, keep it very simple. I don't have to do that, for sure. Could give it a try. Just to avoid any kind of counterplay, and just activate my king later on. So, I'm up a bishop, but also... The bishop is placed on the best square on the board. Take with check. Now has this idea. Don't need to be careful with the rook. And I could play there with g2. Maybe that's like a bit more precise. But in general, when you have these positions, you just want to be keeping it as simple as you can. So with the rooks on, maybe I can get made it somehow. You don't know how these rooks could connect. And just uh, exchange the enemy rook. And with the extra piece, end games are going to be easily winning. Or win a rook. <laughs> Exchange it or win it, you know. That's also fine by me. <laughs> so if he was trading, I was just about to win the pawn and just get a game anyway. So we managed to get this one in. Playing black pieces. 
once again. I'm gonna be going for the Karo Khan and expecting to see an exchange variation. When they play with knight f3, they could also do e5. Most of the time they will uh, end up playing the exchange and uh, I'll try to show you really typical uh, game plan for the Carlsbad structure. So first of all, the knight is actually a little bit misplaced in this structure because the pawn usually belongs there and the knight, like in the London system, will develop via d2. But after knight c3, I'm gonna develop the bishop out to g4 all the time in the exchange variation. Go e6 and whenever h3 happens, typically first instinct should be to go bishop h5 and if g4 is not dangerous, you can just keep the bishops all the time. As a rule of thumb though, I'll teach you a little trick. Whenever they play h3 and the knight is actually misplaced on c3, taking is fine as well because their pawn is going to be quite mis misplaced. Not really misplaced, but it's going to be a lit little bit vulnerable. So, both are fine. Um, just going to go with takes here. Um, and then bishop to d6. I think it's fine. Could also do bishop e7 to be honest. Both are just perfectly playable. I'll just do e7 because... I think most of you guys are maybe a little bit more confident playing it this way so that you don't run against bishop g5. So you don't have to deal with that pin. Both moves are doable. It's just that you have to launch the minority attack. And in this structure also with the knight on c3, knight a5 to c4 works a little bit better. So typically just push the pawns when there's a pawn on c3. But with the knight, I think we just do this and then... Uh, Playing the knight towards c4, put some pressure on that b2 pawn, potentially on the c file as well. So this structure is like really vital to understand and know how to play because you can get it from so many different sidelines that lower rated players do in the Karo Khan. So as long as you know how to play these positions, you're going to be just a... Crusher with the Karo Khan. And also sometimes you have moves like Queen B6 going for a double attack. Not really interested into that, but uh, I can show you a pretty nice trick after his last move because the knight now remains undefended. And if he was not playing B4, let's say, next moves would have been like B5, knight A5, knight C4. But now we have actually a small trick to win upon. Because the knight is undefended and you guys can actually try to pause the video and think about it. And the trick is actually to just go knight captures. This is hanging. He can take, we win it back on c3, keep the extra pawn. And yeah, like knight e5 intermezzo doesn't work. We just take it back with a knight. Okay, on queen e2, we can simply go back, keep our extra pawn. Everything now is way weaker. Could just do knight a5, knight c4 as well, hitting the enemy queen. So many tempting options, really. Queen a5 also looks interesting. Mainly knight a5, knight c4, I think. b5, queen b6 too. Putting pressure on d4. So usually I would just play b5, queen b6 in these structures, because going queen b6 directly will block your pawns. So after that, now bishop b4 is actually available, and that looks like a pretty juicy pin. I'm just gonna go for the pin now, since he allows it, and simply preparing to move the knight away. Okay, rook b1, hitting this, so we can't move the knight. Just gonna do this move, protecting the bishop and attacking the knight one more time. Expecting rook e3, but then we can move it away, and not gonna be easy for my opponent to protect. Maybe he plays like rook b3. Okay, he starts with it. So he could do another trick and win a pawn. That actually might be winning more than a pawn. That might be simply winning uh, the game, you know. But I think I want to play it a bit more simple. Like, let's say 97, hit this, he plays rookie 3, and how do we win? How do we win in that position, guys? Maybe just rook c6, and he cannot really unpin, can he? Yeah, so I think like knight d4 genuinely wins, but I'll just show you the 
what I think to be the easier win. Just opening up Rook's path, he's gonna go Rook E3. And then, he can even go like Knight F5, hit the Rook, and then just double up on the C file. So let's see. Rook E3 is like only move to protect the Knight, I think, and... Yeah, we're just gonna be doubling up. Usually there are gonna be like tactical wins along the way, but typically sticking to solid maneuvering moves will also generally do the job when you're this much ahead. After he gives back the exchange, there's just a win. He just win the knight also. Opponent was simply unable to defend against the pressure on the C file, so now because we're up material, you know that uh, we're just gonna be looking forward to exchange as many pieces as we can, get it into the end game, and with the extra rook, it's gonna be an easy win. So just looking forward to trade as many pieces as we can. Now my knight is under attack, so we'll move it to f5, hitting the d4 pawn as well. If he takes on f6, I'm quite happy because it's helping us to trade more pieces. Also, this is under attack. Rook b3. This again helps us because we get to trade more. Get rid of the bishop. Now time to activate this rook. We don't really care about that pawn. So, just gonna focus on the activity. Preparing to infiltrate onto the second rank. And... Yeah, actually we'll start with a check, and then we'll play rook b2, hitting the pawn, and to be honest, I'll just show you like generally the easiest way to win, just to make the conversion into a winning king and pawn endgame. Because that's like actually the golden rule when you have so much material. You can just literally abuse this uh, edge that you have by uh, forcing all the trades, and then you can just get it into a winning king and pawn end game. And you basically cannot lose when your opponent has only the king. And you're also gonna have a pretty big win rate in this winning king and pawn end games, which should be close to 100% to be honest. Because king and pawn end games are really maybe the first thing that you should be mastering when it comes to end games. They're like very easy to learn and very powerful. And you can just abuse this theme to win this lower rated game, especially short. Sure, you can keep the rook, win with the rook, but usually just um, forcing these kind of winning end games will really skyrocket uh, your rate of converting these winning positions. So we managed to get this one in. Hey everybody, thanks a lot for making it this far into the video. And if you're interested in uh, checking out my London system course, will be the first link uh, in the description. So thanks again, and I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.